What was the largest shark? Megalodon. Easy. Alright, we're done here. End the video. Carcharocles Megalodon is the largest shark to ever live, but not only is it not alone, but it wasn't the first, though unfortunately it will be the last if our actions go unchanged. Hundreds of millions of years ago, the ocean bore a group of cartilaginous fishes that were the forerunners of the sharks. Many of these rubber-skeletoned freaks approached the size of modern great whites, and a few surpassed them and were more comparable to the orcas. Today we'll be taking a look at the top 5 huge Paleozoic sharks you've never heard of. And yes, I realize the uncreativeness of that title, but do you really want no one to see this video? Three hundred and eighty to two hundred and fifty million years ago, from the late Devonian epoch to the Permian period, sharks of all shapes, sizes, and families diverged to take control of the world's oceans. They fell into the top predator niche thanks to their cartilaginous skeletons, scales made of teeth, generalist feeding approaches, and strong jaws and teeth. The sharks alive today are far and away different animals to the ones that patrolled the seven seas of Paleozoic Earth. In fact, it might be unhelpful to label some of these ancient groups as sharks, since many diverged from the shark lineage earlier than you could still call them sharks. Thanks to the wonders of convergent evolution, many of our modern sharks kept the same body form, so they all look like sharks. This makes it difficult to call them anything other than sharks. Before the world's ecosystems were graced with the busty presence of fish like Carcharicles megalodon, the Ginsu shark, or the giant swordfish, other giant fish roamed. One of the more important of the proto-shark groups that grew to enormous sizes was the Tenacanthiformes. Tenacanthiforms were a group of cartilaginous fish that were probably the ancestors to the groups that eventually led to the sharks and rays of today. This makes them sharks by association, but not necessarily true sharks as we see them today. Overall, their characteristics include a fusiform or football-shaped body, a rounded and blunt head brimming with a type of tooth referred to as cladodont. A cladodont tooth is a multi-cusped tooth with one giant blade in the middle with much smaller blades to either side. These sharks were not adapted for slicing through prey items or chunking up bigger things into smaller kibbles and bits. They were great at swallowing things and keeping them blocked behind their jaws. The tenacanths also carried two dorsal fins that had long nasty spines embedded in them. Some of these fish had their first dorsal fin as just a huge spine, while the second dorsal fin was a fin attached to the spine. These spines had an outer layer of enameloid. Enameloid is an enamel-like tissue that covers the scales and teeth of all the elasmobranch fish, the sharks, rays, skates, and every other weird cartilaginous fish. Enameloid probably originated from a dentine-like tissue, and convergently evolved into a more enamel-like tissue. Both enamel and dentine are the substances that make up our teeth, as well as most other land animals. The outer layer of our tufers is the enamel, while the inner layer is the dentine. The tenacanths had your average pectoral and pelvic fins used for steering. Far back near the tail was the anal fin. The tenacanth tail was externally symmetrical and heterocircle in shape. This tail shape is assumed based on the extremely few specimens that preserve the outline of the body. So different members of the tenacanthiformes may have had different tail shapes. Their tails helped propel themselves after an assortment of prey items like sea scorpions bony fish, smaller cartilaginous fish, and probably the bizarre marine reptiles of the Permian. The Tenacanth Heyday was the Carboniferous, when most of the items on my list came from, so let's begin. Good Rick Thieves, Coal Shark The smallest on the list of Tenacanth sharks I'll go over today is Good Rick Thieves. Goodrichthys escdalensis is, as far as my research got me, the only known species of this genus. 
It was originally discovered in Scotland 30 years before it was described in the 1936 paper The Structure and Affinities of the Fossil Elasmobranch Fishes from the Lower Carboniferous Rock of Glencartholm Eskdale by researcher J. A. Moy Thomas. The remains of this shark were first thought to belong to Cladodus by some fella in 1888. Therefore, its crispy, crunchy bones remained just an unusually large specimen of the Cladodus shark. That was, until Lemoy Thomas found them wasting away in the collections of the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. Turns out the first specimen, which is called a holotype, was a rather complete specimen that had to be shattered into nearly 200 pieces of rock. To make the job of putting them back together once they were at the museum easier, the discoverers kindly numbered each piece. Time wasn't as kind, and the numbering was incomplete and in certain cases misleading. Reassembling the specimen was then extraordinarily difficult. That is, difficult for the 1930s. There's so much cool innovations and technology in use today that make this process a hell of a lot easier, but imagine being a fossil preparator in the 1930s. A lot of the specimen's pieces weren't completely prepared before Moy Thomas got to describing them. Some of the pieces had to be split open to connect one piece to another. On top of that, the rock never split cleanly, always leaving a considerable layer of matrix over the fossil. This could only be removed by laborious rubbing with a wire brush and hydrochloric acid. As hard as it was, it was still doable. The only parts of the spooky scary skeleton missing were the pectoral and pelvic fins. Altogether, this specimen would have measured somewhere around 2.3 meters or 7.5 feet. This made it the largest Paleozoic shark known at the time. Moy Thomas named it Goodrichia in honor of Professor E.S. Goodrich. The species name Eskdalensis refers to the locality of Eskdale where it was found. Turns out Goodrichia wasn't valid, so Moy Thomas renamed it Goodrichthes in 1951, when more specimens were found. Dr. Michael Ginter wrote a redescription of the teeth of Goodrichthes in 2009, when more fossils were found. Goodrichthes was rather generic compared to most Tenacanth sharks. It had the same blunt, rounded, almost salamander-like skull, small pectoral, pelvic, and anal fins, a heterocercal tail, and two dorsal fins of cartilage and bony spines. Manzano Tenacanth, the Godzilla Shark A shallow warm water lagoonal estuary system snaked its way throughout what is now the Manzano Mountains of eastern Albuquerque, New Mexico, about 300 million years ago, the Carboniferous, a time when oxygen levels were indeed higher than they are today. Arthropods took advantage of this by expanding into sizes that would make most Karens nope 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 the hell out of life. Life on land was truly bizarre, but so was life in the oceans. Anyone remember the Solenhofen limestone Lagerstaten of Germany? Where you get the exceptionally preserved remains of pterosaurs, fish, and dinosaurs? This particular Lagerstaat is thought to have preserved the remains the way it did due to a layering of the water. Some bodies of water contain different types of gases, or are stratified into different layers, due to other environmental factors. The bottom of the lagoons that made up Solenhofen had little to no oxygen. This killed anything that sunk too close to the anoxic layer, but more importantly, preserved the soft tissues of an animal that died and then sunk to the bottom and got covered in silt. This is the type of environment that existed where the Manzano Mountains are now. The lack of oxygen near the bottom of the New Mexican lagoon system meant that the bacteria that eats through dead things like it's going out of style couldn't survive long enough to eat through the stuff that kicked the bucket. Therefore, anything that died and sunk and got covered in silt was preserved extremely well. Scientists from the Smithsonian, Carnegie, University of Kansas, and the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science have been researching the fossils found in the Manzano Mountains since the 1960s. At this point, intricate details of the plants, invertebrates, small fish, and amphibians that lived in this area are known. The remains of a huge, bizarre shark were discovered in the Manzano Mountains by shark paleontologist John Paul Hodnett in 2013. Hodnett was at a paleontology conference day trip out to the mountains when he came upon the tip of the shark's nose poking out of the ground. This 2013 shark find was one of the most complete specimens of the Tenacanth sharks found to that point. 
Before this beast, there were about two partial skeletons, a few partial skulls, and bacon bits like teeth and spines. This tenacanthiform shark was exposed on its right side in a fine-grained limestone. To get the lovely chum out of the rock and to a museum, it had to be chunked into three segments. They were taken to the nearby New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. All told, the specimen contains the top of the brain case, the right and left upper jaws, the dorsal fin spines, most of the vertebral column, the pectoral fins, and pelvic fins. All of these body parts were carefully chiseled out of their rock coffins by the patient museum staff. The creature remains unnamed, so it's been given the nickname of the Godzilla Shark or less bombastically as the Manzano Tenacanth. The team working on the Godzilla shark have used computed tomography scans to take a look at the head. This will help to determine whether the shark is a unique genus and or species, or a new species of an already known genus. The Godzilla shark is unusual for its size. It's currently the largest vertebrate fossil found in the Manzano Mountains at about seven to eight feet, or two to two and a half meters. It was probably a female since it's missing the claspers, the sexual organs found on the pelvic fins of males. Clearly this heavily spined shark was one of the top predators of the estuaries in this time and place. Kaibab Venator, Shish Kebab Shark Now we meet our first truly enigmatic shark of the list. Most extinct sharks are only known from teeth, Thankfully, the teeth are diagnostic, which means you can tell the difference between species and genera just by differences in the teeth shapes, for most sharks anyway. Everyone, including myself, always wonders if the Grand Canyon has any fossils. Considering it's one of the largest geological wonders on Earth, it would be very weird for there to be no fossils there. One of the many layers of the rocks present at the Grand Canyon is a Permian-aged one called the Kaibab Formation. This layer of rocks is a sequence of limestones and sandy limestones. They were deposited as a shallow sea transgressed inland. The earliest collection of vertebrate fossils from this layer of rock was made all the way back in 1882 by Charles Doolittle Walcott. Yeah, that Walcott. The Burgess Shale Walcott. He did some digging in the Grand Canyon and found some cool critter bits. Not much would be done on the vertebrate remains found in the Kaibab until the late 1990s. The world's preeminent expert in tenacanthiform sharks, John Paul Hotnit, published a paper with three other researchers on the tenacanthiform sharks found in the Kaibab Formation. One of the largest, most mysterious finds was named after the rock, Kaibab Venator Swifte. This shark is known only from a few complete teeth and a single partial tooth. This tells us very little about the animal as a whole, but since the overall body parts of these sharks remain somewhat similar from genus to genus, a good estimate of what the kaibab hunter looked like can be attained. Whatever this thing looked like, it was A, huge, and B, equipped with wicked twofers. The largest of the teeth measured up to 30 millimeters, 30 centimeters, or an inch. The teeth were large, blade-like, and serrated, which fits well in the archipelagic super-predator feeding niche inhabited now by the modern great white shark. Michael Ginter, the guy who redescribed some of the good Rickthes teeth, also described the teeth of the other tenacanthiform, Tenacanthus tumidus, in 2010. Apparently, he found that tenacanthid twofers that measured about 3 centimeters means a body length approaching 5 to 6 meters, 16 to 19 feet. That's in line with the modern great white shark. That's also the exact length of the largest Kaibab Venator teeth, and thus, Kaibab Venator is estimated to be a big fat whopper, a honkin' chonkin' fish missile, a torpedo of titanic proportions that ruled the warm, shallow seas of Permian Southwest US, one of the first giant sharks. Though, larger relatives lurked in different seas and different times. Texas Super Shark, Fossil Cryptid. During 2015, a story about the remains of a giant Paleozoic shark made the rounds to your usual news networks. These stories weren't unfounded in a 2017 paper by Dr. John Mazey and friends describes those same remains. The brain cases and teeth of tenacanthiform sharks were found eroding out of a spillway near Lake Jacksboro in Jack County, Texas. 
Researchers Mark McKenzie and Robert Williams, with the Dallas Paleontological Society, took the fossils they found to the American Museum of Natural History. The fossils come from a layer of rock dating to the late Carboniferous period, somewhere around 323 and 298 million years ago, which is called the Finnish Shale Member of the Gram Formation. This rock is usually known for a bunch of bottom-feeding animals, like mollusks, corals, sponges, brachiopods, bryozoans, and crinoids. So these new shark bits are very exciting. The fossils themselves, though, aren't particularly hair-raising, nor are they diagnostic enough to represent a completely new, unknown creature. What sets them apart from anything that's come before, though, is their size. These brain cases are enormous, about 15.6 centimeters long. Like with the teeth of Kaiba Venator, these fossils are not impressive without context. The team of researchers figured the aptly named Texas Super Shark may have reached as much as 5.5 to 8.8 meters, 18 to 26 feet in length. That's as large as the largest predatory shark of today, the Great White, but also exceeds the maximum average length for the whites. Not much else can be said about the Texas Super Sharks, since they're known only from brain cases. But whatever they looked like, they were the giants of this particular era and time. Even 300 million years ago, everything was bigger in Texas. Saivodus, Orca Shark Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh are some of the most well-known names in dinosaur science, but there were many other scientists during their time that did a great deal of heavy shit when it came to the often forgotten creatures of deep time. Louis Agassiz was one such name. He was a Swiss-born American biologist and geologist who was the pioneer of paleoichthyology and one of the biggest influencers on ichthyology. The Christmas Day of 1834, Agassiz was invited to Britain by William Buckland. He was the Megalosaurus guy. Agassiz made it over the following year with his artist Joseph Dinkle. This trip brought a lot of notice to the wealth of British fish fossils. Throughout the 1830s and 40s, he set to work describing them all in a ton of papers. One of Agassiz's supporters was William Willoughby Cole, a member of British Parliament. Cole had studied under Buckland, so they all knew each other. Cole was able to include a bunch of his fossil fish specimens into the series of Agassiz papers, all of which came from early Carboniferous-aged rocks of Ireland. Agassiz referred a majority of the specimens in this collection to the genus Cladodus. Over the next hundred or so years, nearly 50 species were erected in the genus. They would be whittled down bit by bit in a 2006 paper by fish guys Dr. Christopher Duffin and Dr. Michael Ginter would find only a few to remain valid. One of the teeth specimens assigned to the Cladodus name was too distinct and too large to belong with all the other Cladodus parts, so they gave it a new name, Sivodus striatus. It's known exclusively from a collection of teeth very reminiscent of the other tenacanthiform sharks. However, its teeth have a very wide root, with rather small side blades and one giant middle blade. These teeth reached as much as 6 centimeters along the greatest length. The Sivodus specimens described by Duffin and Ginter would have belonged to an extremely large shark, probably exceeding the Great White. Now, Mammoth Cave National Park enters the shark ring. January of 2020 saw the announcement of a specimen of Sivodus found in the Kentucky National Park. This time, the fossils were found on the ceiling of a cave, and this time, it included parts of the skull. The new Sivodus remains were announced by the other shark and fish guy, John Paul Hotnett. One of the jaw pieces is estimated to measure about 2.5 feet or 0.7 meters. This would have belonged to a 15 to 28 foot, 4.5 to 8.5 meter shark. This puts Sivodus in between the size class of the great white shark and the orca, and also makes it the largest shark on this list, as well as one of the largest sharks of the Paleozoic. These sharks saw a dip in biodiversity by the Permian period, before being pushed out by the equally large or larger Eugeniodontids, like Helicoprion and Edestis. Not much else is known about Sivodus, but it will likely be a pretty cool shark in the future. Hope you've enjoyed Fossil Fish Week. More themed weeks are in the works, so stay tuned for that. I'll offer you this sneak peek for what comes in April. 
Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Steve Bradshaw, Thais Fenson, Arda Bayer, Ray M, Dana Manchester, Aphid Kirby, and Chris Frampton.